So if you're going to be doing specialized work in tree assessment, I'm going to show you a few case studies of how it's done. If you're not ever going to do any work and not planning to do any work in hazard tree assessment, I'd like you to follow these slides along because if you see an occasion where the tree needs to be inspected, you could explain to the client what the inspection entails if they want to hire somebody. Um, in order to do this, you have to understand tree biology and the structure and function relations of trees. You have to document all your observations and measurements, and there are numeric formulas that are available. The one that most people use has been published by the International Society of Arboriculture. It's entitled Photographic Guide for Evaluation of Hazard Trees in Urban Areas, Second Edition. If you're going to do this as a specialized part of your practice, I strongly urge you get this book. It's full of information on how to do inspections. It's full of information on relative risk levels. It's full of information involving case studies of hazard trees in the past. Uh, and the ISA also sells uh, pads of, whoops, this uh, microphone's having a hazard, isn't it? Um, they sell you pads of 50 sheets so you can record the information on hazardous tree assessment to give to the client. And so that's, that's the form that's used. I, I asked uh, Laura and Nikita to have a form available for each one of you. Whether or not you ever use this form, uh, you can explain to a customer if you recommend a tree evaluation, this is what they do. The upper uh, left-hand corner of the front page of the form has a little box where all the observations that you've made get summarized into three numbers. The first number is the failure potential of the tree. The second number is the size of the part of the tree that might fail. The third number is the target rating. That number plus that number plus that number added together equal the, the hazard rating. So the hazard rating is the sum of three factors, failure potential, if it's low failure potential, it's a one. If it's extreme, it's a four. The size of the defective part. If it's a small part, it's a one. If it's a big part, it's a four. The target rating. If there's no target, if it's like that uh, ponderosa pine that I made my wife stand inside of, out in the middle of nowhere, it's a zero. There's no target. Unless silly tourists make their family members stand in front of it, there's no target any other time. And up to... A, possible of an extreme uh, group of targets all the time. So if after your inspection, looking for defects, you conclude there's low failure potential, you give it a one. You conclude there's medium failure potential, you give it a number two. If there's high failure potential, you give it a number three. If there's severe failure potential, you give it a number four. If the part that's going to fail is less than six inches in diameter, you give it a one. If the diameter of the part that's likely to fail ranges between 6 inches and 18, you give it a number 2. If the part that you judge is likely to fail has a diameter of 18 to 30 inches, you give it a number 3. If the part you judge is likely to fail has a diameter of greater than 30 inches, you give it a number 4. If the target rating, if there's no target available in, in sight, you give it a 0. If it's an occasional use landscape, you give it a 1. Intermittent use, you give it a 2. Frequent use, you give it a 3. Constant use, you give it a 4. So you could, in doing an inspection, if the tree has low failure potential, if the part that's going to fail has a very small size, if they're an occasional use, you could have a hazard rating of 3. That would be a relatively low Failure potential, right? Relatively low hazard rating. On the other side of the extreme, you could have a failure potential of four. The tree is going to fall any minute. The size of the part, if it's more than 30 inches, you give it a four. If the target rating is constant use, you give it a four. What does a 12 signify? It signifies an extreme level of danger. And that's the sort of information that is conveyed by the tree care specialist who specializes in hazard assessments, what they give to the property owner. There's a caveat that I have to make sure you understand. It's in the book and it's in arboricultural practice. If there's no target rating, that's the only condition 
under which you do not do the adding. 1 plus 1 plus 0 mathematically is 2. But if you have a zero target rating, your hazard rating is zero. Because if there's no target, there's no hazard. If nobody can get hurt, what are you worried about? Similarly, even if it's at the high end, if you have a four plus four plus zero, your hazard rating is still a zero because no target, no hazard. I'd like to show you a couple of case studies. You want to see a couple? This just out of the, just give you an idea of how it works. Here's one uh, involving a maple tree. It was a, ma a pre-existing tree. It was saved by the developer uh, for use in the landscape of a newly developed property. Um, it was a multi-trunked maple. Uh, it had been growing prior to construction of the house. The construction activities involved putting in foundations, which severed, cut up the roots. The trunk had dieback, significant dieback. Uh, an irrigated landscape was installed in the yard all around the tree. It was inspected and the inspector determined that the tree could fail several ways. The branches could fail, one of the multiple trunks could fail, could split out, or the entire tree could fall over. The uh, inspector determined that the failure of the largest trunk, 28 inch diameter trunk, remember that number, 28 inches, was the most likely thing to fail. So the arborist had a high failure potential. Number three, size of the defective part was between 18 and 30. So it got it a number three. If it was more than 30 inches, this number would have been a number four. If it was less than six inches, this would be a number one. Remember that code I showed you? And the target rating was a four because it was a house that had a big family with lots of kids and people coming and visiting all the time. The landscape was in constant use. So 3 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10. This is a picture of that structure. There's the house right there, and there's the tree. Now, the developer did a good thing. It's, I think it's a good thing when developers save pre-existing trees and landscapes. It should be encouraged. But when a developer wants to do that, they should hire a tree maintenance specialist or a tree care specialist to give advice on which trees should be saved. If you were hired to do that, would you recommend that they save a tree that had seven trunks? Probably not. If you were hired to do that and it had one single trunk, would you recommend to the developer that they push the footprint of the house away from the tree so that the foundation activities wouldn't sever the roots? That tree should be 15 feet away from the house. You can't move the tree that easily, but before the house is built, they could reorient the house on the lot. When an arborist gets hired by a developer to give advice on which trees to save, that's the kind of things the developer is paying you to do. In this case, the developer had the right idea, but he didn't hire anybody who could give him advice on which trees to save and which trees not to save. And consequently, he saved the wrong tree, and it was too close to the house creating a relatively high hazard. Here's another case study. This is a uh, sycamore tree. Uh, and it's growing out in the middle of a field. There's an arrow pointing to a opening. The opening is like nine feet tall. It's got a six foot trunk diameter. It's leaning towards one side in an open field. But the field, it's got a fence all around it. There's no access. And when you think no access, there's a high possibility of no target, right? The inspector was asked to inspect that tree. <laughs> this tree was a real mess. Most of the canopy extended to one side, an open field, had a cavity in the trunk that was 20 feet high inside the uh, trunk. The side opposite the cavity had vertical fissures, vertical cracks. They decreased the trunk's ability to resist twisting winds. The trunk had Fungal fruiting bodies, fungal conchs, both Ganoderma, Ganoderma and Daldinia. Testing with an electric drill showed that most of the trunk area was decayed. It was a hollow column of decay. Since the trees in an open field, far away from any activity, there's no target, therefore no hazard. Failure potential was four. The tree was already leaning, it already had cracks, and it was going to fall real soon. Size of the defective part, 
six feet in diameter. <laughs> That's more than 30 inches, right? So it gets a four. The target did not exist. So four plus four plus zero equals zero. That's a much worse tree than case study number one, but it's like in real estate. You talk to a real estate person who's just passed their real estate test, and they say, oh, I'm so happy I passed it. And I say, what are the three things you learn? They say, I learned location, location, <laughs> location. They also learn get your money up front. Um, if, there's no, if the location of the tree is such that there's no target, there's no hazard. This true story. This was a true... Uh, um, inspection was done on the west coast in California. And there's a, there's a drawing of the tree. Trunk diameter is six feet. The height of the opening is nine feet. I'm six feet four. I could walk right in there without bending over. The hollowness went up 20 feet. The, there was one foot of good wood and another foot of good wood and four feet of decay in the middle. A true story, it really happened, but there's an ending to this story. The tree, or the, the property was sold. The original owner sold it to a new owner. The new owner wanted to develop the property. The new owner wanted to turn that property into a business commercial office building where there would be people 24-7 coming in and out. Needed to get an inspection. Same inspection as before, failure of the entire tree is highly probable. Since the tree is in an open field, far away from any activity, oh, I should have crossed that out. Um, crossed that out. The, the develop, property is going to be developed. Oh, that's the wrong slide. There's the slide I want. Development of an office complex was planned, at which time the tree became potentially hazardous. The tree was a historical tree. It was on the county's list of trees that has had historical things happen in association with them. The law was very strict. It's against the law to cut the tree down. The arborist did the report, showed that it was an extreme hazard. Failure potential was still four. Size of the part, six feet diameter, was still four. Target was four because of a 24-7 office complex. 4 plus 4 plus 4 is 12, but it had to be preserved. The tree couldn't be taken down. I think some treaty or something was signed underneath it because it was such an old tree back in the 1800s. So what do you do then? What you do is called mitigation. <laughs> 